Welcome. I'm currently in our nation's capital in Washington, D.C., staying with my brother and his family, and I'm actually helping them move. They'll be going to Pittsburgh. So it's 20 years of packing, and I'm glad I'm here to be a blessing. But I've only been working on my class, and I'm grateful that you guys were willing to wait an hour for class because I've been having so many um, firsts with technology. <laughs> it's been a challenge. And I just want to thank you, Jason, for helping me and being such a, you're, you're my truly my best blessing. So um, I want to share my foraging adventures up to New York. And um, I left my beloved mountains. Hold on a second. <clears throat> so I go down by pushing the down arrow. All right. So I yes. left my little white, my, my, my Max and Jason and the beloved mountains um, about 10 days ago. And I wanted to see, I, I actually was coming up to my niece's um, graduation from high school. Her name is Meredith. And Jordan came down from New York City to celebrate her. And so I decided to go up to New York City with him to help him get situated into his apartment. And so I wanted to see what kind of riches were in um, the concrete jungle of, of New York. So... There's a scripture that we've talked about many times. Oh, Lord, how many and varied are your works. In wisdom, you have made them all. The whole earth is full of your riches. <clears throat> so I was curious to see what there was for Jordan to eat if, uh, you know, if he needed it to. So here we are. So we stopped at my hometown of Morristown, New Jersey for lunch. And this is the Morristown um, Community Center where I used to spend lots of time swimming lessons, etc. And this is just a wonderful little town to grow up in. And so we went after that, we drove to my childhood home about five miles away. And a Jeff, my main objective was not to see the house, but to see the woods next to it, which was adjacent to the home and the fields and the creek, Pompeston Creek, um, which you can see on the left was a place that I spent many, many hours as a child. So um, on the way home, I stopped there for about three hours of foraging and it was incredible. So I'll share that with you at a different time, all the things I found that I didn't know about when I was a child. Okay, so that was fun. And then we started up I-95 to New York. So seeing the mountains of the Big Apple as we drive over the Verrazano Bridge into Brooklyn, and Jordan lives in Brooklyn's Greenpoint. His apartment is not actually on the street here that you can see on the right. His apartment is the one on the left. It's B, you have to go through a corridor to the left of this building that you can see and go through this dark corridor into a patio. And then his apartment is on the other side. So it's just amazing because you can't actually hear any traffic or sirens at all. So it's just back in the back here. And in that little patio, there are beautiful roses and mint and wood sorrel and violets and even poison ivy. All right. Um, James Wilkes shared this with me after I left New York, but this is going to be a complete destination when I get back. There is a app called the New York City Street Tree Map. And I just it's just the coolest website. Um, and so it maps the trees that are in New York City. So I want to share with you a little bit about that. So they said, New York City's trees shade us in the summer, beautify our neighborhoods, help reduce noise, and support important urban wildlife. Beyond these priceless benefits, our urban forest provides us a concrete return on the financial investment we put into it. Our publicly owned trees are in much of an asset, as much of an asset to us, as our streets and sewers, bridges, and public buildings. Using a formula from the USDA Forest, Forest Services iTree software, we present some of the concrete ecological benefits related financial value to the city in the, United, in the New York City street tree map. So here you can see on the left, stormwater intercepted each year, um, how many gallons, and if you go into this website, it'll tell you what that even means, and it's fascinating. So the value of that is $10.5 million. Energy conserved each year, 
air pollutants removed by the trees each year, carbon dioxide reduced by the trees each year is uh, almost 4 million. And the total value of annual benefits of the trees in New York is almost $103 million. I just think that's so fascinating. So you can type in the address that, you're cons that you wanna find out what the trees are. And so I've typed in Jordan's address and I found out that Brooklyn has 181,230 mapped trees. And um, the trees that are on his street are honey locust, pin oak, Japanese pagoda trees, and linden trees, which is one of my favorite wild edibles. There are 234 species of trees in Brooklyn. Each tree has an ID number and a trunk diameter that's measured each year. And you can tag your very favorite trees and share with your friends. And the site provides education on how to be a good steward of these amazing green giants. So I was fascinated by the trees in New York City, but now I'm even more fascinated and I absolutely cannot wait to go back and check out the trees in more detail using that incredible website. All right, so the real reason why I went to New York is because Jordan just got a, a new apartment, tiny little apartment, but he didn't have really much furniture at all. The only thing he had when I showed up in this living room was this couch. And the story about how he got it in his apartment is just crazy. Um, actually, he couldn't get it through the door. And so he was really kind of depressed about it. And his friends whipped out a, a tape measure, measured the window, which was quite tiny, and was able to actually get the, the couch into his living room through the window on its side. And so that was there and it looked awesome. But then he put up the Ansel Adam photos that we brought from home and he um, mounted them really well above the couch. That looks pretty cool. So that's the real reason why I was there. And I had my car so we could shop and not have to get an Uber to take things home. Um, first thing we okay. did. Okay, can I, can I show Jordan's video now? Oh yeah, absolutely, go ahead. All right, welcome to Greenpoint, Brooklyn. You've just seen some of the finds that Mom discovered at Transmitter Park, which is just down here on the waterfront. And um, yeah. Greenpoint is home to a lot of great restaurants, a lot of great shops, but also a lot of sound stages where they do a lot of film production. And I've done some work here at Serret Studios. There's a bunch of sound stages down here where various commercials and TV shows will set up and they will shoot movies and TV shows. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a good neighborhood in Brooklyn. I recommend it. Yeah, there's actually some trees. And there's a movie theater we just discovered. So lots of good, cool things going on. And look, Jordan, there's trees on top of that building too. Yeah. All right, let's go get our... So that's sort of Midtown, and that's uh, that's Financial District down there. Financial District. And then here, next to the water, is just a park. And I've noticed that there is a ton of shepherd's purse. Look how cute they are. So this is a mustard. All mustards are edible. But I just love these, because look at how their little seed pods are going to be tiny hearts. And I have looked for these everywhere where I live, and I've only ever seen them once. So I'm pretty excited. So cute. Maybe I'll get some of these seeds to come and clean in my yard. Is that ready? Mm -hmm. Okay, so <laughs> this is so exciting. Not only is there milkweed and all kinds of motherwort and amazing grasses here, but there's a ton of bee balm. This is Monarda fistulosa didyma. And here it is. It's got a square stem, like all mints have a square stem. It has the opposite branching and the desic desiccate where it goes this way, then 90 degrees this way, then that way. And then it has an amazing pungent aroma like all mints do. And uh, so this is a wild oregano. This will have beautiful red flowers 
or purple flowers in a couple of weeks. So this is amazing. Talk about abundance. It's everywhere. Over there, those big, big leaves. Anyway, so exciting. Thank you. Milkweed is starting to bud. Can you believe it? This is the broccoli stage. It's too immature to eat at this point, but in a little few days, this will be very delicious. I can't believe it. So excited. And you can see the latex whenever you break the cell walls. Here's more of the, um, the Menard I was telling you about. Look at all this milkweed. I'm so excited. I'm a hot dog. <laughs> Let me see. Okay. I'm trying to get to the next slide. It's not moving. Just take, it takes a few minutes. Just go ahead and press the down arrow and wait and it'll take a few seconds because it's coming off of the, off of the web. Hmm. Try it again. I know, I know. Let me go to the presentation. There you go. That's why. All right, so Transmitter Park is right down the street from Jordan, and I thought it was pretty cool that they have this mural on the wall that's celebrating dandelions. Um, that was right next to where we were looking at the um, East River in Manhattan. So wild food is everywhere. It's unbelievable, all the things I found while I was there this week. Flowers are in window boxes, decorating storefronts. Shepherd's Purse, um, I talked about in the video, the seed pods are tasty. They're like good raw in a salad, or you can steam a whole bunch of them as a vegetable. And I just love using them as curation because they, are, they dry to be these beautiful little brown hearts. In, and I keep them in vases at home. Um, the baby bird was unafraid of humans. I actually got to pet it. And there was milkweed and mugwort and yellow dock and bee balm and oxalis and shepherd's purse and dandelions and clover and plantain and so much more just at this little park. Here's the bee bomb heaven. This is gonna be a real destination. I told Jordan, make sure you go back in a week or two because this will be red and it will smell amazing. I think bee bomb flowers are, well, they taste like oregano, but very, very sweet. And they're beautiful to decorate with as well. We found a drive-in theater across the river from Manhattan, which I think is pretty cool. I bet it would be fun to watch a movie here, um, especially watching, seeing the city lights in the distance right across the river. Um, we also found the first open theater on one of the streets. I didn't take a picture of that. So um, if there wasn't some horror movie showing, it would have been fun to have gone to a movie with Jordan. First time since COVID that he would have done that. All right. So that night I fixed Penny Arabiata with the milkweed shoots that I got when I was at my the field next to my house, my childhood home in New Jersey and they were the shoot stage then. So I just boiled them up and I only did one boiling and then I put them in as a green bean or <clears throat> asparagus type of substitute. So, so good. Um, then day two, we took advantage of having my car <clears throat> and the picked up deals that we found on Facebook Marketplace and we drove, as Jordan drove, I was just looking at weeds and I was astounded at how much Japanese knotweed is everywhere. Um, this is right outside of the, uh, we stopped in Red Hook for lunch and right outside of the pizzeria was some very tasty looking lamb's quarter, which is one of my absolute favorites, especially this time of year. And you can see the poke in the middle. Um, these are right outside of like all of the shops. And, um, so they're not hard to find. They thrive everywhere. I don't think I would eat this cause it really is, um, filled with gas emissions from being right on the street. So, but it is nice to see them. Um, then let's see, here's the pizza. They have coffee shops all over the place. Like every single block has a coffee shop and they have lots of character and um, really special. So Jordan bought a latte there. Pastries are everywhere too. 
When we drove home, there was an unbelievable downpour and a thunderstorm in that storm. And um, I was grateful that we didn't get caught in that, but it was really interesting to watch. When we got back to the house, Jordan put together a table that he bought at Ikea. And um, this is the shelves he got at Ikea as well. And every single thing he put on those shelves to decorate is very meaningful to him. The one, the middle shelf has a deer skull that I found at, um, in my woods in Todd. And so Jordan, when he was at home, he said, mom, can I have one of your skulls? And so I went through my collection and I found um, the best one. So he's got that and he loves it. So that just reminds him of his 4G mom. And then the next day we took off on the Metro to explore New, New York's famous um, High Line. So Jordan, um, Jason, are you gonna talk about that? Or oh, no, let me tell about this first. So on the way, we got off in Manhattan and we walked through uh, the city streets to get to the very end of the High Line. And there's just New York parks everywhere. They have 28,000 acres of municipal parkland in New York. So it's kind of fun how they're just tucked in amongst all these skyscrapers, especially in really expensive districts. There's one that we saw that had you couldn't get into it unless you came in through a tunnel underneath it because it was just for the residents. Another thing I thought was interesting is that all of the restaurants, most of the restaurants in New York are now putting, because of COVID, outside dining along the streets, which made the parking even more crazy, but we were just walking and it was interesting to see. And that way they were able to keep open and have outdoor dining and um, with COVID this past year. And then I saw um, a forager's restaurant, which I thought was interesting because foraging is really kind of in vogue um, and it's very expensive. The things that we pick for free, um, these people are charging in our Meadow Lake for. So I never went in or saw what's on their menu, but I think it's fascinating that that is what's being done. And I would love to forage for these restaurants and get paid pretty a pretty penny, I'm sure. Okay, so Jordan's gonna tell us about the High Line here. Okay, so welcome to the High Line. This is an elevated park in New York City. I don't think a lot of people know this is here. It's one of the lesser known attractions of New York City. And I brought mom here because it is an elevated park that has lots of cultivated plants. But as we are discovering, we've already found some milkweed, which seems to follow mom wherever she goes. But there's lots of weeds here as well. I'll talk nice and loud so the wind noise, my voice carries through. The High Line is built on an elevated rail track that used to support the meat packing district here in New York where trains would come in from upstate New York with uh, hogs and sheep and cows to be processed by the meat packing facilities here. And so if you just pan the camera around, you'll see, uh, in fact, even behind you, Mom, keep panning, you'll see these old buildings that used to be depots where they would bring in the livestock to be slaughtered. And then, of course, what they've done now is they have many, oh, many years later, Look, so yeah, there's, there's, the tracks. The, there's the tracks. And then many years later, they've now turned it into a park that you can walk. And it goes all the way from 12th Street all the way up to 34th Street, which is quite a few city blocks for a park to live. And all above the street. So the street is down below us about 30 feet. That so if so you ever cool. come to New York City, come to the High Line. Oh, definitely. This is so worth it. Okay, so let's just go on the Highline for a little bit. So I thought that old rails make really great planters. And even though most of the things are cultivars that they've planted and gardeners have put in place, there were still lots of weeds. Um, this was an interesting aspect of the Highline. Um, this was a like a stadium that was um, made over the roads and you could just sit looking through the glass at the traffic below. Abundance of clover everywhere. And so when you when you see this, I mean, I don't know what you see, but what I see is I see spinach and I see protein and I see um, fritters and all kinds of delicious. And not only that, it makes an incredible tea and it's an incredible blood thinner. So there's just so much about clover. We'll do a whole hour on this on this plant sometime soon. OK, and I just thought that was pretty. 
there's some thistle and, and there, let's see what I see. Oh, that's milkweed and then there's allium and those seeds are super tasty. So when you get your allium at this stage, whether it's garlic or onion, make sure it smells. And if it smells garlicky or oniony, then you're, you're good to go. Um, there are some poisonous lookalikes, but they don't smell at all like garlic or onion. Um, anyway, these seeds are really good to eat raw or put in salads or just cook with. Um, look at those beautiful roses on the left. You could smell them from, I mean, some roses are everywhere and they're fragrant and they smell so good. Um, this is a new one that Mark Williams just told me the name for and I totally forgot what it is on the right, but I thought the color splotches was so pretty against the, um, the background. This is hazelnut on the left. And in the middle are these sumac flower inflorescent bobs. And they, I just learned, are good for making a soothing tea for tired, sore eyes, which I really have tired, sore eyes. And so I would love to make some of that. I would just suspect that you make an infusion and then um, possibly add a little bit of sea salt and maybe some marshmallow. And that would be a really, really good eye drop to heal eyes and to, um, that would be so soothing. On the right are juniper berries, and there's a lot to say about those, but we'll just pass them by. But you could just see them everywhere. Um, I love this picture here of the uh, these beautiful pink flowers. I'm not sure what they are, and just the buildings behind it. That's the shed on the left, which is a remarkable piece of a feature of architecture, unbelievable. And more Japanese knot white on the right, on the left-hand side down that road. At the very end of the edge, or at the very end of the high line, um, there is something called, what is it called, Jason? Harbor, Harbor Yard or Hudson Yards. Hudson Yards, that's what it is. And so Jordan's going to tell us a little bit about that. And then we'll go up on top of that building on the far right in the picture. You can see that ledge coming out at the top. And I'll just briefly tell you about it before he gets started. I just got this off of their website. After hiking the entire high, high line, Jordan took me up to the edge to get a bird's eye view. It was incredible. The edge, this is right off of their website, is the highest sky deck in the Western Hemisphere, located at 30 Hudson Yards with a one of a kind design. It's suspended in midair, giving you the feeling of floating in the sky with a 360 degree view that you can't get anywhere else. Look a hundred stories down from the thrilling glass floor or lean out over the city on angled glass walls. <laughs> it was amazing. The only thing I think that would be more amazing would be to get there early in the day and or in the afternoon and then just bring a bring a picnic for dinner and then just watch the lights come out or watch the sunset and then the city light up. I think that would be amazing. All right. So go ahead, Jason. Okay, so we are at the end of the High Line as it currently exists. It does continue to extend north to 34th Street, but you can see over here, this is the rail yard uh, that on top of, on top of this rail yard was built up to your right. This is Hudson Yards. It's the newest neighborhood in New York City, an entire neighborhood built where previously there was just rail lines. The largest and most expensive private development in the history of all private developments. So mom and I are going to go head up to the edge, which is one of the tops of these buildings. There's a, a rooftop that you can go check out and uh, see what the view is. Tell us about that uh, glass building over there. That's the Javits Center. It's the largest convention center in New York for hosting big trade shows and big events. During the height of the pandemic, it was also the place where they housed uh, spillover people from the um, hospitals. Wow. Yep. Okay. But okay, so if you, you see the Empire State Building, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, if you look across the river, just to the right of the Empire State Building. Do you see some of those sort of half-built buildings down there that kind of look a little bit like yeah. just beyond that? That's Greenpoint. That's where I live. Oh, that's where we were on the water. Okay, yeah, we have never seen those buildings. And do you see, here's another one. Do you see the Empire State Building? Do you see to the left of the Empire State Building, the canal that kind of goes back yeah. and there's that bridge? That's the the Pulaski Bridge that we drove over. Okay, I remember that. Mm -hmm. um, what else? So where I used to live, um, in New York is just on the other side of the Empire State Building where I used to live in, in uh, Manhattan. And where's Ketchum? Ketchum was, let's see if we can see it from here. Um, it's covered by some other buildings, but... Uh, Look at this crane moving. Oh yeah, let's watch it. It's cool that they're still... Yeah, there's the Hudson River. Yeah, that's the Hudson River. 
cookies and unusual shapes. I I'd like to know how they build stuff like that. Oh, they're crazy. They call it Billionaire's Row, those big tall towers there, because it's all these billionaires buy these multi, multi million dollar apartments. Like Chinese Where's billionaires. Where's Times Square? That's a good question. So Times Square is. Uh, Market for it. It's funny because Times Square is kind of small now. Actually, um, do you see? Let's see if I can give you an example. Um, do you see the building that says H and M on the side? I do. That's the south end of Times Square. It's kind of hard to see from here. That's kind of where Times Square is. And the Rockefeller Center is. You do it. Again, a little hard to see, but it's that building that says Comcast on the top, way back there, that's kind of big and wide. And where's the Statue of Liberty again? Way down there. This is the Hudson. Oh, this is the Hudson, okay. That's the East River. That's the East River. And the High Line is right there. Yep. Oh, we never showed me Central Park. Let's find that. I did show you Central Park. It's that gigantic park right there. Let's see how big it is. It's just one of the billionaire apartment buildings that have been built. I don't know what that one is called. Oh, I like that. That's awesome. It's a pretty decent amount of time to park. Especially when I used to live in the city, because it's a little easier to get to. How far is it? Is it from yeah. Ketchum? Oh, from Ketchum? It was a 10 minute walk, 5 minute walk. It's very close. But I didn't really spend much time there. It's just working. Alright, when is King Kong going to come out from one of these buildings? Well, if he did, he'd be the Empire State Building. That's the famous one. True. That town's stratosphere. Okay, so that was fun. Um, here's some pictures from the top. And so the next day, um, <clears throat> I went by myself on a metro uh, train to Central Park. And uh, it has 843 acres. <clears throat> it is the most visited park in the United States and the most filmed location in the whole world. So the reason why I went by myself is because I wanted to meet wild man Steve Brill, who's one of my foraging heroes. And uh, he <laughs> he took us on a tour, and there's about, I don't know, 40 of us or whatever, around uh, most of one side of the park. And it was so fascinating. He taught us about 20 different wild edibles along the path. And he used an app <clears throat> that he had created to show the life cycle of each plant that he was teaching on. He was so entertaining and interesting and certainly memorable. Um, and I'm really certain that he lit some fire, wildfires. I was especially interested in the way that children responded uh, on this walk to this wild education, because I think that it is something that God has placed in the heart of every person to know creation, <clears throat> to know its gifts and treasures and to be stewards as we were intended to be and to be blessed by them. So it was just awesome. And Jason has a little video to give you an idea of this crazy, wonderful, wild man. We have a birthday girl here. <laughs> Violet, what do we say to the birthday girl? Happy birthday. <laughs> Don't eat anything poisonous and you'll live to be 27. We're going to we're gonna look at the key features of the plants and make sure we have them right. We'll go over all of the food and medicinal uses, ecology, science, some history, folklore, mythology. If you're more interested in cooking, we'll cover more cooking. If you're more interested in medicinal uses, or if you really hate your boss, we'll go over lots of poisonous plants and all the symptoms. <laughs> If you eat the wrong plant,
as it leaves and white flowers that bloom in the fall. So the cow ate the plant and got poisoned. <laughs> How many of you love animals? Then you'll be happy to know the cow had a way of getting rid of the poison. Watch out for the bike, you've all signed the consent form. Scooter. Um, and the cow put all the poison in the milk and the cow was fine. What do you think happened next? People died. People who drank the milk died. And no one could figure out why one day the milk was good to drink and one day the milk was poisonous. Um, so somebody decided to figure it out. But um, it was a woman. Women weren't supposed to do science in the 1800s. It's going to be bad for your ovaries. <laughs> <laughs> you should just take two chores and take care of the kids. Um, uh, and this woman didn't care. Her name was Anna Pierce. And uh, she was uh, very courageous and determined. Uh, she had already gone to medical school, which you're not supposed to do in the 19th century if you're a woman, but she didn't care. She went to dentist school. She learned to be a midwife. So if you're out in the middle of the woods in the frontier and uh, you broke your arm, you have a toothache and you're giving birth at the same time, she would come and help you with all, all three. And uh, so she wanted to figure this out. What's the first thing you do if you have a new problem as soon as you get home? You want to solve a problem. What would you do? Well, there was an internet back then. There was. Yeah. Okay, where was the internet of knowledge about native plants in the 1800s? Native Americans. And in a, a group of Native Americans, who would you Google? The healer. The healer. The healer used plants for healing and was also the religious leader because they believed the plants had spirits and if any plant ever had a bad evil spirit in it this What's is it, it. Called? Sorry. white snake root oh. it has a white flower that blooms in the fall and it has a curvy uh, root that reminds people of snakes and it's as deadly as any snakes if you uh, eat this plant or you drink the milk you start to shake it affects the central nervous system uh, you get too weak to stand you lie down you get sicker and sicker and eventually it uh, stops your brain from telling your heart to beat and you die though they did find someone who can eat this without being harmed yeah Donald Trump he has no brain and he has no heart <laughs> so uh, <laughs> so um, Anna Pierce talked to a Native American shaman, but not only was she uh, a Native American, which is one point against her in the 19th century, she's also a woman, which is two counts against her. So even though she helped save thousands of lives, her name is lost to history. She's referred to as Mother Shawnee. And she told uh, Dr. Anna that the symptoms of milk sickness are identical to the symptoms of white snake root poison. And back then, they did, the Native Americans didn't have literature. They memorized all of the stories and all of the uh, uh, medicinal uses and all of the poisons. So they had really good knowledge that got passed down totally accurately through the generations. So what do you do next when you have a hypothesis of what could be causing this disease? Test it. What kind of a test can you do with 19th century technology? Yes. A cow, you can't, uh, don't have the chemical assays to detect the poison, but you're a plant. When the leaves are edible, that would be uh, first coming up at the end of September, uh, hanging in there through the winter, if the winter isn't too cold, and then growing like crazy in early spring. And now the, um, uh, the leaf is too tough to eat, but you eat the flowers and the bulbs. And uh, in another, uh, uh, few weeks it dies to the ground and then you have to wait till the end of September to find it again. So these are my paintings of the um, seeds when they're fully open, the flowers which we haven't seen but maybe we'll see them later, and the young plant wow. when you can eat the leaves. That is... This is, yeah, so these are different, uh, different stages and this is all part of my app Wild Edibles Forage which you can download with pictures, info, uh, recipes and bad jokes. <laughs> These are 
Pray for the dead, and the dead will pray for you. Because the dead have nothing else to do. Okay, first we're going to dispose of this. This is the Indian strawberry. Everyone take one and uh, look at it. It has a three-parted leaf. Called a compound leaf. Leaves fly sometimes split into segments. Let storm winds pass through them. And with climate change and larger storms on their way, uh, this is ready for it, showing that this is a uh, Republican plant. <laughs> so it's called the Indian strawberry because it comes from India and all the, um, and uh, the berry is very dangerous to eat because it looks so good and then when you when you eat it it has no flavor at all. <laughs> Okay, wasn't that fun? So I'll just take you through some of the plants uh, that he shared. So this one was a new one to me. This is June berries, and June berries are, um, they taste like a mix of an apple, an almond, and a blueberry. No lie. But they're better when they've turned purple, and there was only a few that were a dark red, but they still tasted pretty good. And they're called June berries because um, the berries come out in June. And they're also called service berries because the flowers are magnificent and those come out in April. So many people would use these in April for funerals or weddings. And they just called them service berries because of that. I thought that was interesting. Their bark is amazing. And also the, the shape of the shrub. They don't have a central trunk. They just branches literally come out of the ground. Okay, and this is that white snake root that he was talking about, Ageratina altissima, and this is so prolific that I really think I'm going to do an entire class on poisonous plants, and this will be one of the ones I feature, because it's just everywhere on my mountain. I have literally spent um, days getting rid of it on my acre, <clears throat> and the way I do that is, first of all, never, never let it go to, um, I don't even let it bloom, but as soon as it starts to bloom, then you recognize it and you just rip off the flower head and throw these seeds right into the trash. Don't leave them on the ground or you're just spreading them. Okay, so the reason why I'm concerned about this plant as well is because it's similar with its serrated, serrated margin to the wood nettle, which we've been um, you know, fangirling over in our Wild Blessing site. And it's such an amazing wonderful wild edible and it has a very similar looking leaf structure so at, before the flowers come out it would be easy to mistake that and it's so much of it you think oh look at all this wood metal and this is such a deadly plant that it can honestly kill you very little of it um even kill you from eating um, drinking the milk from cows that ate it so i want to share something interesting he told us about about anna pierce this woman who discovered this um learning from the shaman women. But let me just read this to you. So um, she made it, let's see, where, I think I lost that. Okay, anyway, um, in the 1800s, Abraham Lincoln's mother uh, was, he was only eight at the time, drank the milk from a cow that had eaten snake root and she died. And so that's one famous case. But the interesting thing is the doctor, Anna Pierce, she discovered she was passionate about this because her own mother had died from this and so did her sister-in-law. So that was um, one of her motives, I'm sure. So just a glass of milk could kill, could kill someone. It was called milk sickness. People died from milk sickness, poisoning from cows that had, had eaten white snake root. So she came up with the idea of let's pasture cows, let's put them in fences so that they can't go into the woods and forage off of these poisonous weeds. And they had the constitution to not be affected by it their calves would be and humans would be but cows weren't so she was not um appreciated for that because no one believed her they just thought it was fake news but it really is true so that really she had a lot to do with fencing in cattle um let's see yeah i think that's important and i'll definitely do a class on it because i want you guys to get rid of it on your land if you have it and at the very uh, least know what it looks like compared to wood nettle. So the next one, oh, here we are, we're taking a lunch break. And so here's Steve sitting against a tree eating his wild lunch and I sat next to him eating mine. And um, 
it was just such a good time. He was good friends with Linda Runyon, who you know is was my mentor, and I just treasure her. So being able to discuss her was fun. Um, here he's teaching in the middle, and then on the right you can see he's talking about burdock, and he's holding a second year stalk. Here's some burdock on the left. It was literally everywhere. This is ironwood, which is in the um, in the beech family. No, in the birch family. Um, I don't know a thing about it. I had to get on botany every day.com or no Facebook page, which I've been telling you all to do. So when you have a, a question as to what a plant is, take a very good picture, post it there and tell them where you found it. And they will within minutes tell you what you've got and then you can research it. This of course is sassafras on the right, sassafras albitum. And he was telling us how it's gotten such a bad name because of the saffron that's in it but there is 40 times more of that constituent in beer and no one ever says a thing about, oh, don't drink too much beer. So another thing I learned about sassafras that was new from him was that the inner cambium of the roots tastes just like star anise. It's such a strong seasoning. And he was saying, I don't understand why people don't you know, season with this because it's so prolific and it um, is so good and tasty and good for you. Um, here's more burdock abundance. And what the fascinating thing was, guys, is that I got to go foraging. And so I didn't carry a shovel with me, but he had one. And so I was constantly digging up roots. Um, and I learned also that garlic and mustard, which we've talked about in detail, their roots taste of the first year plant taste like horseradish. So dug those up um, and got to fill my foraging basket or bags and filled. <laughs> I'm sure I look quite a sight going on the subway, but I'm sure nothing is too unusual here in New York. Um, I also saw my first ripe, unripe mulberry. I've never seen or tasted a mulberry before, and they were just too unripe to try. But um, I found some back when I was driving down to DC at my old homestead, and there was like endless trees of mulberries, and I collected quite a few. He went down to the river there or the lake. Uh, there's quite a few lakes in Central Park. I don't know the names of them, but there's cattail growing right there. So we were sampling the cucumber stage and also they, they had, some of them had already made the female flowers with the male pollen above. So we got to eat, I collected that and put that in our, in our um, breakfast the next day. And then growing right next to it was poisonous iris. So it was so much fun to see the contrast of the lookalikes and how they really are very, very different. The iris is quite flat as it fans out at the base and the cocktail is quite oval and circular. Okay, this is a beautiful weeping willow on the left. So when I see that, I think of salicylic aspirin or the acid, which is the precursor of aspirin. And on the right is this really cute little precocious little girl named Zoe. And she was just so fascinated. And she was always looking for mushrooms. She's only five, but knows so many of these plants. She's been on quite a few of these walks. And it was fun to see what a little expert or imagine what kind of a little expert she'll be as she grows and how comfortable she is with nature. Japanese knotweed, it was everywhere. So it's past the bamboo stage. It's not the edible stage anymore. Thankfully, my freezer's full of it. Um, but it was fascinating to see that. And he didn't talk about it because he only talks about what's on nature's shelf at the moment. And this is past um, time to eat. Uh, more fragrant roses. Well, I just felt so honored to be learning from one of the best. And <laughs> it was just what, probably one of my biggest highlights in my foraging life. And so I so enjoyed it. Well, I brought home lots of free groceries. Um, and it was, I spread it all out, you know, garbled and on display. And so Jason's going to show a video of these are all of these videos together. We didn't have time to separate them where they should be. So this will show you from bringing home the bacon to eating it. And I did make burdock root bacon. So that was pretty cool. All right, go ahead, Jace. Step one, wake up, brother, gonna rise in the sun. Step two, get some good, some food in you. Step three, you grow hard about what you want to be. Step four, everybody just do your thing. Wake up, today's gonna be a good day. Wake up. 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 Today's gonna be a good day. 
Wake up, today's gonna be a good day. Wake up, today's gonna be a good day. Wake up, today's gonna be a good day. These are the fixins for a wild omelet. So in here on this brown plate, we'll see all of the options. This is the cattail uh, pollen, the male pollen, which is a superfood. This is the cattail flower, which is um, very corn on the cob tasting. This is poor man's pepper in the middle. And this is Malvin Neglecta um, marshmallow seed pods, or they're actually, I call them cheese wheels. And this is the piece de resistance. This is like an artichoke heart. These are the burdock caldunes, the inner stem of the second year plant. And then mm -hmm. just for some vitamin C and color, I have some fresh rose petals. And then I've got burdock bacon from the root. So I'll show you what the omelet looks like when I'm done cooking it. This is a lot of nutrition here. I am so excited. Eleven years ago, my mom came to visit me for the first time in New York City. At the time, I was living in Jersey City, two rivers away from where I'm sitting now in Brooklyn, New York, in Greenpoint to be specific. And I was told at the time that New York City was a scary, scary, scary place, that no one smiled at each other on the subway. Uh, and the general, the general uh, review was not her cup of tea, if you will. Now, 11 years later, and we've spent the past week here in New York, including yesterday's foraging adventure where mom went with Steve Brill to Central Park. And from her Central Park foraging adventure, she made a breakfast this morning that was, I would wager, just as wild as any of the meals she has made in the mountains of North Carolina. It was an omelet that included cattail pollen mixed in with the eggs, which gives it a super food super nutrient addition to the meal without adding any sort of flavor. Burdock, inside the burdocks, the, the shoots and the stems and the roots, which made for a kind of a bacon uh, uh, contribution to the meal, as well as marshmallow, which is a plant that makes little cheese wheels that kind of taste like cheese and work their way into the mix very tastily as well. Poor man's pepper as seasoning. I think some rose petals, just to make things interesting, and then capped off, capped off with cheese, can't go wrong with cheese, just regular cheese, as well as bagels from Bagel Point here in Greenpoint and donuts from Peter Pan Donut Shop in New York City, or excuse me, in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. So what I would say is, A, if you've ever considered New York City as a place to forage, highly recommend, and the results of, of this morning's meal are good evidence of that. And then the second thing I would say is, if you're like me and you like more, your more metropolitan foods, Bagel Point in Greenpoint and Peter Pan Donuts in Greenpoint are two places that I would put very high on your to-do list. Thanks for watching. Okay. All right, so these are garbled on display. There's the milkweed, or I'm sorry, the marshmallow on the left. There's the cattail. You can see the, the male um, pollen is on the left and the female cob is on the right. It's going to be dark brown after it's completely pollinated. Um, when you collect these, I'll do a whole class on cattail because it's just such an amazing supermarket. And on the right is the poor man's pepper. And this has the most amazing flavor. And the reason why this was such an important plant in uh, throughout uh, European history in particular is because when there was no refrigeration to keep rotting food from rotting and tasting terrible, they would put spices over it. And the spice route going through uh, Europe into Asia to get the spices was very dangerous, wrought with all kinds of adventure and pirates and not pirates, um, you know, thieves. And but then they would take the boats and go around the horn to get to um, the Asia to get the spices. And that was also fraught with all kinds of storms and pirates. So Christopher Columbus set out to find a new route to the spice, to get the spices, which were so important for preserving food and for flavoring. And so um, that's the story of the spice trade. However, 
if you were poor, the poor man's pepper would have such an amazing, strong flavor that um, people would use that to cover up the taste of rotting food. And it really is delicious. So I used it to make a peppery flavor in my omelet. Here's those ingredients that I showed you in my video. The pollen is such a superfood with the uh, male pollen of the cattail. And I just threw that right into the eggs so that it, you couldn't even taste it. But it was, I don't know. I don't even know what it tastes like because I was just putting it in my bread or whatever, pancakes. Here's the burdocks blessings. There's the root on the left. There's the stems in the middle. And these are the stalks of the second year plant. So some of my students have been asking me, well, Holly, what part of the shoot of the second year uh, do you use? And it's actually the very bottom um, where it's the pith is quite juicy. You just have to peel off all this outer epidermis and um, to get down to their artichoke flavoring. And you can eat it raw. It has an amazing flavor. It's not tough. It's not um, fibrous. It's just really yummy. But I did what I did is I cooked it very lightly for maybe three minutes in hot in boiling water. And then I put it in a marinade. Um, actually, I just used olive juice and marinated in that overnight so that it would have a really good flavor when I put it in the omelet. So this is some wild nutrition. It's all but the bagel, of course, is not wild, and the eggs are not wild, and the potatoes are not wild. Everything else was, and um, drinking it down with some mink charrette, if you know what that is, it's amazing. So it was just a great, great breakfast. So I didn't get a chance to make this, but another coffee substitute is, I'll show you, This is these are the Kentucky coffee tree beans that I foraged for in Central Park, and I'll show you what they look like in person as soon as I get off the slideshow, but this is what the tree looks like. And then it has that on the right is one leaf. And it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight leaflets. And on each leaflet, it has quite a few opposite um, branching leaves. Um, so this is called compound um, pinnate. And that's the biggest leaf I've ever seen. It even puts Buckeye to shame. Pretty amazing. Okay, and then the, there's the beans. And so what you do with these little tiny beans that you take them out, they're poisonous, everything's toxic unless they're roasted. Um, so you don't want the, the gelatin part. You wash that off and you get the clean beans and then you just roast those and then grind them and use them as you would coffee. So eating wild, even in New York City. So that sums up my foraging, uh, foraging forays in the Big Apple. But as I meditated on what I learned this past week, um, this verse came to mind, and I'll read it. It says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made. And I, and I, and I just... I'm just like in awe of his generosity and his abundance and his beauty and uh, the things we learn about God through the creator, through his handiwork is, um, is so compelling to me. And one of the reasons why I love the Lord so much, but um, yeah, I wanted to share that verse with you. So, all right, I'm going to just try to get back on screen, Jason. So how do well, I Well, you're back, you're back on screen. I am. So, Yes. And so uh, why don't you lean back just a little bit so folks can see you a little better. And okay. I do see I see a couple of comments that I wanted you to answer. And one of them was about pesticides in Central Park. So did Steve real talk about that or are you aware of any concerns about pesticides when you forage in Central Park? Hi, I see you now. Um, yeah, I I did. And so what was fascinating to me is that Central Park is a natural park especially the places where we were. So maybe there's places where there's actual gardens that were planted, but there were no gardens. It was just all weeds and, um, and beautiful flowers that just grow naturally. So that was fascinating. And it's so far away from any traffic. It's, it's like many, many, many acres. Like I think I, I, think I said 864 acres. So it's, it's a lot of land where there are no, um, there's no traffic. So I, I felt perfectly safe. And of course I washed it off anyway. Okay. All right. Another another question was uh, regarding you mentioned some particular plant or maybe it was a root that tastes like star anise. And I 
whoever it was didn't uh, quite catch what particular plant okay. that was. This plant is called sassafras. Oh yeah. Yeah, and that is that is the reason why Daniel Boone even went to my country was searching for sassafras. And I'll teach a class on it sometime. But I did not know that the inner cambium of the root, um, or in the very early the stalk right above the root, tastes just like marijuana. So he uses it all the time in his. Uh, he has a web cookbook, um, which is amazing. So if anyone's interested in that, check that out. And he, um, so he was saying he uses that seasoning a little bit. Okay. All right. So on the way back home, I stopped. Um, well, first, let me show you the Kentucky beans. So this is what they look like. Isn't that cool? And when you open it up, it's so gross. Do you see how sticky that is? And there's four beautiful beans inside. And those beans uh, need to be washed off. All of that gooey stuff is toxic, so just clean it off. And then once you've cleaned it off, they look like this. And then you grind that up and um, or roast it first. And that makes it not toxic. And it tastes like coffee. So I've heard. I can't wait to try it. Um, so on the way home, I stopped by my old homestead. And I'll be doing a um, tour or a foraging tour of that because it was unbelievable. It was just amazing. The fields that I used to play in are now woods. And that's crazy. But I got some um, rocks from, um, we needed more rocks back on our mount, right? <laughs> so I got some more rocks. And I also found, Karen Headley, you'll like this. Um, these, I found a bunch of unripe sweet gum fruits. And so I don't know what to do with, I know Karen, you do a lot with them. So I wanna collect more, but there's just a lot to share with you. I'm so excited about it. And another gift I wanted to share with you that my sister-in-law gave me is this book called The Herbarium. And so I'm going to be devouring this, and you guys will get to be the happy recipients of the things I learn. But it just goes into incredible detail in the history of different plants, and oh, I'm so excited. So that was a, um, a belated Christmas present. So I'm excited for that. And I'm really grateful. Um, you all are wild blessings to me. And Jason, thank you for helping me make this happen. And I hope this was a blessing to you. Goodbye. <laughs>